As regular viewers on this channel might have noticed, I've been agonising over which A camera to buy next. And as you can see, I finally made a decision. But I'm going to run it for a few weeks and use it on a couple of jobs before I actually say what I think. And I've noticed there's a misconception amongst many people over exactly how freelance owner operators get to choose the camera they buy. And it's very rare for you to be able to choose your favourite camera or even the camera that you think is best. Now what you have to do is you have to fit in with what your clients want. You have to fit in with their workflow, their editing and even the camera that your competitors are using. So I'm not necessarily going to tell you that this is the best camera you can buy but it might make the most business sense. And only time will tell. Ta -da. And here it is, the PXW FX9. And a very handsome looking camera it looks too. The first pre-production one of these I got to play with was matte black, but I think this gunmetal gray, silver, looks a lot better. It almost looks like a baby Venice. I wonder if that's a coincidence. This camera was launched by Sony at the last IBC on Friday the 13th in Hall 13. I'm glad they're not superstitious. But I knew immediately that this would be a great replacement for my aging F5. And yet, most of the reports I've seen seem to position this camera as an FS7 replacement. At the price you pay today, this camera comes out at almost twice the price of an FS7 Mark II. But I think it's a totally different camera. Yeah, there are some things that look similar. And to be fair, the current lineup of Sony large sensor cameras is quite confusing. In the group they call handheld camcorders, you've got the FS5 Mark II, the FS7 Mark II, and now the FX9. And then if you want the posh Cine Alta badge, you've got the F5, the F55, the Venice, and even the F65. Now I've spoken to some dealers who tell me that they haven't sold a single F5 or 55 in the last 12 months and that effectively makes them discontinued. And when you look at this FX9, in many ways it outperforms an F5 and if you ignore the global shutter, even the F55. Those sensors were designed possibly over eight years ago and they're beginning to show their age. But if you ignore those cameras, that means there's a huge gap now between the FX9 and the Venice. And I wonder what will fill that gap. But without wanting to start more rumours, let's look at the headline specs of what we've got now, the FX9. Most importantly, it has a really impressive full-frame 6K sensor, although you can only get 4K output on this camera at the moment. It also has dual base ISOs, an internal variable ND, which is really impressive, and I'm told autofocus, which is better than sliced bread. On top of everything else, it has an impressive array of buttons. This camera looks like it's got a separate button for all of the things you need to adjust while you're shooting. It's got a separate dial for the variable ND, a separate audio pot for each of the four channels, some traditional clicky buttons for the gain and the white balance, and a separate direction pad for moving around the menu. I thought that I'd miss the side display on my F5, but I don't. With dedicated buttons for things like white balance or even the thumbnail to start playback, it's actually quicker to press a button on the side of this camera than it is to go through layers of submenus on the display of your F5. You've also got no less than 10 assignable buttons, six on the camera body, one on the viewfinder and three on the hand grip. The first thing I did was assign button 9 to the high-low base ISO function. It's underneath the gain switch, a little bit recessed as well, because you don't want to press it while you're recording. It will change your picture, but it's very useful. Something you still can't do on an assignable button is punch in from full frame to super 35 size sensor. It's something you want to do when you haven't got time for a lens change, but you just need to punch in for a slightly tighter shot quickly. And I'm not sure why Sony never want to allow us to do that on an assignable button. And on the other side of the camera, we've now got time code built into the camera body, which is a major thing for FS7 owners. It's also got a viewfinder plug, which looks like the FS7, but isn't. And talking of which, this viewfinder setup, 
It looks like Sony were designing a great camera and ran out of time. It reminds us of the design that everybody hated on the FS7. It's much better than that. The screen resolution is noticeably higher, and Sony have squared off one of the rods here so that it doesn't droop at a jaunty angle. It's just that this whole loop arrangement is a bit, eh, a bit flimsy. Don't get me wrong, the picture is great and it's very usable. It's just not as solid as I'm used to. When you turn the camera on, it does start up surprisingly quickly. I've got a picture already and now it's stable. That's really impressive. Can hear a bit of fan noise though. It's only noticeable when you're not recording. Having the variable ND on its own dial makes it so much more useful. And when you turn the ND on now, it replaces a clear piece of glass. So you don't get those diffraction errors when you put something extra in front of the sensor. I'm probably being a bit old school, but coming from an F5, this hand grip with the zoom and the iris controls is a revelation. Although you've probably noticed, I've swapped the standard Sony screw on the arm here with a push button thing from Shape, which allows me to move the arm quickly and easily out of the way. Without that, you can't even put the camera down on a flat surface without it falling over. So I think it's essential. On the whole, I really like the extra controls you get with this camera. I was all fingers and thumbs at first, but there is a logic to it, and now I've got used to it, I really enjoy it. But this camera has a major problem. Power. The FX9 uses quite a lot of it, and in full frame mode you could be pulling 35 watts. And on top of everything else, this camera has absolutely no power outputs at all. It uses the standard BPU style batteries, just like an FS7, but it's not so easy to put a VLOC adapter on the back of this because the DC input is a rather unbelievable 19.5 volts. I mean, what were they thinking? And strangely, the power supply that you do get with this camera is the same sort of power supply that you get with a Sony VO laptop. And I'm beginning to wonder if there was a warehouse full of laptop power supplies they needed to get rid of, because I can't think of a single good reason why you would do such a thing. The issues that this 19.5 volts causes are both expensive to solve and pointless. I do hope that Sony haven't done this just to protect their battery market, because that would leave a bad taste. Have you noticed when new cameras come out, manufacturers will often make a launch video. And this is usually a craftsman making something super detailed, just to show off the capabilities of the camera. Well, I had a couple of hours free, so I thought I'd make my own. Actually, it's a really good way of getting to know the camera and figuring out where everything is. But the important thing here is, I wanted to show you pictures as they come straight out of the camera, out of the box. So no grading, no log. This is custom mode with the Cinetone profile. And I won't touch the pictures at all. All I needed to find was a good subject, a craftsman who could make me something super detailed. Unfortunately, they were all busy. <laughs> I think probably my earliest memory is as a young child, eight or nine, go with my granddad into his shed. He was a trained carpenter, French polisher. The smell of the wood, the dust in the air, the old golden Virginia tins full of miscellaneous screws and nails, the joy where he shared his skills with me. We've all heard the proverb, a bad workman blames his tools. But actually, not many people know the second part of that proverb. A bad workman blames his tools, but a good workman doesn't have bad tools. And for me, the tool is an extension of myself. And, and if you don't respect those tools, how can you expect to come away with a project that, that is going to deliver your vision? A tool needs to be sharp. It needs to be able to cut into the wood. A chisel is literally an extension of my hand. What is it I'm trying to achieve? 
What will the project be used for? Who will use the project? I want to put something of myself into everything I make. Often, I find myself just losing time before I know it. I've, I've just been working for seven, eight, nine, ten hours straight. I like to make many different types of projects and I'm inspired by things I see around me. It could be from nature. Obviously, I take a lot of pride and satisfaction in making something that's practical, something that can be used every day, whether it's uh, used in a domestic environment, a professional environment, and of course, my own, the creative environment. To hand something over to someone and see the joy on their face when they can imagine using that, that tool for, for many years to come. I could have shown you pictures shot in log and beautifully graded afterwards, but what would be the point? I didn't have to touch those pictures at all and everything was shot with this tiny battery light. Obviously some of the shots would have benefited from the extra dynamic range of shooting log, particularly those with a window in the background. But straight out of the box, the standard pictures from this camera are really impressive and not at all Sony-like. Considering how quickly I shot that, I think this might make a really great documentary camera. As usual, I went down to my favourite spot to test the dynamic range. I've taken this shot with many cameras, but I can't remember any looking this good. This is the standard Cinetone again, and now in S-Log3. Now at this point, I imagine that I could leave all of the camera settings exactly where they were, and just switch to S-Log3. Then I'd be able to just slap on a Cinetone LUT in post, and the pictures should go back to exactly where they were. Unfortunately not. The recommended LUT to do this is Sony's S709, but that's designed for the Venice and it doesn't work so well on this camera. The colours turn out a little bit green and there's definitely some colour changes. I'm sure it's an easy tweak, but I think we need a dedicated Cinetone LUT just for the FX9. I've seen some people have tried to make them a little less green, but it can look a little sepia. On the subjects of LUTs, something missing from this camera is the ability to save and burn in your own. There are no user LUTs. And when I spoke to somebody from Sony about this, they questioned why we even need them. Well, I was using them to save different camera profiles of different camera makes, so I could work with other people who have different cameras. Now I have to leave that to overworked editors. Oh, and another thing. There's no monitor LUTs in HD. They're all in 4K. The other headline feature is the dual base ISO. And with a full frame sensor, you'd expect this camera to work really well in low light. Once again, I went to my favorite spot to test. The low base ISO is 800. And as we step up the range, it does look very clean. all the way up to 4000 ISO. So rather confusingly, you've got a choice of shooting the same ISO rating on either of the dual base ISOs. And as should be obvious, it does look cleaner starting with the high base and winding the ISO down, rather than starting with the low base and winding it up. But when we just look at the noise levels between the low base 800 and the high base 4000, there's remarkably little difference in noise. All of that was shot at f4 because I was using this 28 to 135 kit lens. I say kit lens because it's sold as part of a kit if you want to, but 
you really shouldn't buy it that way. I got this almost a thousand pounds cheaper than buying it as part of the kit. This lens didn't work too well on Super 35 size cameras, it was too tight. But on a full frame FX9 it starts to shine and 28mm is now wide enough to be useful. Looking at my test chart I see very little breathing and everything looks super sharp even to the corners. It's worth noting here that it's not quite as sharp in the corners when you're using a Super 35 size crop. It took me a while to work out why but I think it's as simple as the fact that you're not using all of the glass. You're still shooting a 4K image but with a Super 35 size crop you're only using the center of the lens. But the star feature of this lens is autofocus. It's really impressive. Possibly the best autofocus I've ever seen on a video camera. Not that I ever need to use autofocus, obviously. One thing I do need is image stabilization. And this camera doesn't have it. Well, not directly. The camera has a motion sensor that records all of your movement and writes that down into the metadata. That can then be used by the Sony software to stabilize everything in post, and it works very well. The trouble is that it adds another layer of complication to your client's post workflow, and they're usually not happy about that. What we really need are plugins available for Final Cut, Premiere, and Avid. I seem to have spent a lot of time listing all the problems I found with this camera, and it does have some issues. The power, the viewfinder loop, user LUTs, and don't even think of using 2K center scan for anything other than slow-mo. The aliasing is horrible. But Sony have listed new features we might see in future firmware, including a 5K scan of the full frame sensor, which should give us 4K at 50p. And that would be very welcome. A 6K output would be nice as well. The trouble is, you start looking at the pictures that this camera produces and you can forgive it almost anything. And this sort of picture quality is not difficult to achieve. The thing about this camera is it's all about that full frame 6K dual ISO really nice looking sensor. And it's difficult to put into words what it is about the colour science and the texture, the dynamic range that makes this camera look so good. But out of the box, it just looks right. I don't actually know if this is the best camera I could have bought, but I do think it's probably gonna be the best selling camera of the year. It gives you 95% of the picture quality that you get from a full frame Venice. It really is that close. But it's in an easy to use single operator style package. Happy days.